Welcome. Welcome to our channel. Uh, I am Chantel Campos, and this is my amazing husband, Carlos. And if you haven't met us yet, we just kind of wanted to give you a little bit of an overdue, overview of who we are. So um, I'm going to go ahead and interview Carlos, uh, just so you can get to know why he is the way he is and why we do what we do uh, and where it all started. So we're going to start from the beginning. So Carlos, yeah. where were you born? I was actually born in Arizona. I'm a desert rat <laughs> in the heat desert of Arizona, actually in Safford, Arizona, which is uh, Southeast Arizona, a small town, uh, in, you know, towards New Mexico area, just Southeast Arizona. And um, tell us a little bit about your early years, um, your family life, the family dynamic that you were born into, raised with. What did, what did that look like for you? Well, so I was born in Safford, Arizona, but then quickly moved away. I didn't, I don't even remember being in Safford that, that then, um, but uh, I was born out of wedlock, meaning my mom was just dating my father and and um, yeah, I was a birthday present. I was born uh, nine months exactly <laughs> after my dad's birthday. <laughs> so kind of right on target. Um, and so, yeah. And somewhat, you know, kind of a surprise, but not an accident, as my mom tells it. Just the surprise, of course, it wasn't like it was planned. Um, but then my mom quickly moved away with me. Uh, and this, she kind of told the story before my dad was really, uh, had a challenge with alcohol. And so again, as she tells the story for me growing up, when I was a little baby, she was nursing me. And one of the times he got intoxicated and, you know, went to swing at her or something and hit me instead or something. I, I don't know the exact details, but something like that. And she was like, that's it. Like, you know, you don't hit my baby and she left and moved went to um phoenix arizona at that point i think it was like phoenix area but so but you weren't her first child so what were you born into how many siblings did yeah, you have true. and what were those dynamics yeah so i was middle child um uh, older brother marty and younger sister tamra and so i was the middle child but um we all have different dads. That's all I'm going to say. We're a very blended family. <laughs> we all have different dads. So mom definitely uh, had relationship, multiple relationships. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, um, you know, you talk about moving away from, from your biological dad. Um, but who did you, you know, who was dad to you? Yeah. So that's the story as my mom tells it. I didn't remember any of that, of course. Um, but who I thought was actually my dad was Tamara's dad, my baby sister. His name was Floyd. As a matter of fact, my um, earliest memories are, I my name used to be Chuck Burton, because that's Tamara's dad's last name is Burton, and his name is Floyd. Um, and so I was Chuck Burton, and yeah, so I was, <laughs> I thought he was my real dad. And so it is, you know, interesting to think about him as a as a real dad and and you know the the fun that we had I do remember wrestling with him Marty and I wrestling with him and he was he was cool like that he'd get on the floor with us and wrestle he loved sports we we were all into football and things uh he had a very strong temper he was very religious for sure um you know we couldn't come to the table without a shirt on uh we got spanked for a lot of different things. <laughs> if we didn't eat our vegetables. We got spanked. If we, yeah, I just remember. I think one thing uh, was he was very strict, and and one time I he told me to go sit down. And I thought he meant in the living room. We were in the bedroom, and I remember him grabbing my hair and throwing me back on the bed and saying, "No, I meant on the bed." You know, you know, everyone has their memories of things, <laughs> and he's passed away now. And um, so then, even that. When my mom divorced Floyd, uh, I was old enough to kind of experience that. Tamara was still pretty young. And I was like, what about my dad? And I was like, 
I want my dad. What about my dad? Because I thought he was my real dad. And then she made me aware of the fact that he wasn't my real dad. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it was kind of one of those situations where uh, she was caught in the middle and, and did the best with what she had, obviously. And, and, and she was now a single parent with three kids. So, yeah. So then um, discovering that Floyd wasn't your real dad, then what, what transpired, you know, age seven. So that, yeah, there's no doubt it was an identity crisis. I mean, I was, there's no doubt. I, re- I think back to even when I was just so confused, like, what does that mean? And, and I remember coming home from school and asking my mother, like, what is it about me? Why am I so dark? And people are asking me if I'm like, if I'm, why I'm dark. And my mom used to just say, well, you tan really well. <laughs> and again, not to a young kid, of course, not wanting to try to explain everything, but my dad was my real biological father was Carlos Campos. And that even came out. She, she told me about and that he was Mexican. So then it made sense of why I was darker skinned as a little, a little guy. Um, but it's weird how I can remember those questions by, I don't know if it was students or teachers. I mean, like first grade probably is all it was. Um, Cause it's not like I was going to school that long before. And then she left Floyd. So then I'm like, okay, this dad's abandoning me and I can, I can remember. So one of the things that happened, my mom really struggled. We were really poor. Um, and so again, my memories may be different than my mom's. So I'm just going to tell the memory like I remember because I love my mother and she's such a great mother. So I do want to make that clear. But one of the things that I remembered was uh, we, she was really poor and it was a bad situation trying to raise three kids and she was trying to make ends meet. And I remember um, that she even had to get food from the uh, shelter that she was working at or not shelter daycare Mm -hmm. to, to, you know, kind of take it out of the covers because she didn't have enough food for all of us kids and for us kids. And so that's how we ate at first. And, um, and then she thought it would be best that I, since I was a middle child, my brother was old enough to babysit my baby sister. And I was in the middle to help, um, make ends meet to be able to feed all the kids. Help her get on her feet. Yeah, help her get on her feet and stuff. She actually had me go live with my grandparents, Burl and Phyllis Lawrence. And the reason why this I'm bringing this up because it was all during the time of that divorce and her trying to make things work. And because and I remember the time because when she took me to my grandparents to live with them, I remember thinking like, "What's wrong with me? Why are you abandoning me as a kid?" I just felt like. She was abandoning me. These are my grandparents. I love my grandparents. It wasn't anything new. They weren't bad people or anything. I was like, Mom, why are you leaving me? And then I also remember, because um, this was the last time I saw Floyd. Sometime, for some reason, it was right around Christmas, but I was a little guy. And Floyd was the stepdad that I thought was my real dad. He brought me presents for Christmas, and I was at my grandma's house. Now, whether that memory's right or not, I don't know. I could verify it with my mom, but this is the child's memory. And so... Which kind of leads to trauma, right? What yeah. we experience in our lives that we've learned about people. So my personal situation was I felt abandoned at that time. And and then um, also Floyd, my stepdad, brought those gifts and then he left. And I remember thinking, well, when will I see you again? And I remember he just walked out the door because he couldn't answer that question. To be honest with you, I never, ever saw him again. And I'm interesting. Aha uh-huh moment. Yeah, some emotions. <laughs> oh. Didn't expect that. <laughs> and what do you feel about that? recognizing yeah the pain yeah. is there yeah the identity that got lost during that time why wouldn't he tell me anything why wouldn't mm-hmm. he say I'll be back or I'll see you sometime and then recognize it I never saw him again 
And what's interesting is like um, the memories of him is not necessarily the best part of the wrestling part and the sports was fun, but how strict he was and a disciplinarian spanking hair pulling, I, you know, all those things. It's like, well, you know, you, you, you realize, well, it wasn't a very good father when you look back, but you also then are like, but that was dead. I never thought of that. So. Yeah. So I guess probably that hurt. It's nothing I've never looked at or ever looked at. Didn't realize uh, that's probably where a lot of past abandonment issues came from that I didn't realize mm -hmm. um, were there. It's interesting. More so my, him than my mom, I guess. <clears throat> yeah, it's interesting that, you know, in the story, sometimes we create a dialogue that is easy to skip over some of those painful parts. And I think that, you know, that happens naturally, like our human brain, um, just out of protection. Um, and so, you know, now at 47 years old, sharing your story and yeah. and accessing you know from a different lens gives you the ability to see something different because yeah. you are working with so many clients yeah. through the same stuff I'll through that stuff too yeah it's cool yeah it it's is cool how and daddy issues uncover. right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. and uh, and i do remember my mom telling me like it wasn't my real dad and 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 she actually told me then that i would be meeting my real dad um that was her way of telling me and then letting me know that I would get to meet him. And then she was telling me the good things about him. And mm -hmm. so it was interesting because then going from, uh, let's see, going from then living with my grandparents, uh, that's a huge like moment in my life that I am super grateful for. You know, as a child, I kind of the story I felt was that I was left there and abandoned by both not only my mom, but my dad, who I thought was my dad. Right. Like I said, that final time I've ever seen him was him giving me Christmas gifts and then leaving. It was a brown truck. <laughs> Interesting. I can remember that brown semi truck. <laughs> uh, but anyways, <laughs> weird memories. But uh, then the the example that I had with my grandpa is in and grandparents, actually. It's forever embedded in my spirit. And by the way, my mom ended up actually moving in with um, Marty and Tamara. Um, at least it's all my memories. <laughs> we can verify with mom. With right? the grandparents too. Yeah, with the grandparents. My mom ended up moving in with the grandparents. Uh, so I don't know, maybe a couple of months I was there. But the thing that was so consistent while I was there with my grandparents um, in, before my mom moved in was every morning I would get out of bed as a little child uh what is first grade second grade probably seven six six, seven. six years old yeah so um and I remember seeing him always oh like this like this example like this with the bible on his lap every morning I'd come out to the couch and see him and he would be reading and so it was just something I saw and knew that when I'd get up in the morning he'd be doing that and he was um he's always up before me and he was always in the word and so it was like that thing of like, wow, this is amazing. And then every single time I'd ask grandpa a question about life, you know, little kids ask tons of questions. He is so awesome. The one thing that he was constantly doing, we'd be like, well, let's see what the Bible says about that. He would never answer me directly. He always took me to this thing. So it is fascinating now then how that's my habit of life too, is I always turn to that for answers in practical ways of life, which then leads to what we do now, really, and ultimately, in, as far as that, that foundation. So then <clears throat> you're living with your grandparents and, and you've gone through the transition of, you know, Floyd leaving and then you meet <laughs> my real dad, the Mexican dad, the Mexican dad, <laughs> the Padre. <laughs> Puzzle piece. Gets and put so, together. Yeah, I remember it's like this big deal. Chucky at the time, 
Um, I'm named after my father, Carlos. That's why I go by Carlos now, even because um, I'm Carlos Carlos Ramon Martin Campos II. <laughs> and so um, now it's time to meet dad. We, my dad, uh, we drive, and I remember still like it was yesterday at this certain restaurant in Safford, Arizona. So we traveled from Phoenix to Safford, a few hours trip. And we get there and we're going to go meet my dad for the first time. My mom takes me and I don't even know where my brother and sisters were. I don't remember them being there, which is kind of strange. Maybe but they were with your grandparents. I don't know, maybe. But so um, we walk into this restaurant and he's sitting at the table and I remember him getting up and kind of hugging me or something. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, oh, hi, <laughs> sit down. And we're, I'm just kind of like, I'm shocked. <laughs> because I, as a, as a young child, I was pretty thin and, and fit and healthy. And I always, I like soon as, you know, when you're, when you're little and you're thinking of these visions of, of what your dad's supposed to look like, <laughs> especially like have this vision of this thin muscular guy. <laughs> and my mom, I still remember when we left that restaurant when I met him and the plan was actually, we were meeting with him. He's, I was going to meet him for my first time and I was about seven or eight years old. And then we were going to the house for a big party, which Mexicans, my dad's a Mexican family, they know how to put on some parties. And so I was like, Chucky's coming home. <laughs> so having this big party, didn't know any of them. But first of all, we walk out to the car and I remember getting in the car and my mom was like, so what do you think? <laughs> and in true childlike fashion, I said, well, he's fat. <laughs> he's really fat. <laughs> and yes, my dad struggled with diabetes and was overweight and had a belly, you know. Uh, I love my father, uh, my dad, Carlos. He's passed away. He passed away when I was about 19. But we'll anyways, the point, we'll get there. Right? Yeah. But anyways, the point being is that, yeah, it was kind of a shocker in true childlike fashion. Then we go to see the family. And I walk into this house and everybody wants to give me a hug and a kiss. And they're saying, mijo, mijo, mijo. I'm like, oh my God, what is a mijo? <laughs> Which is my son. For those who don't speak Spanish, it's like my son in Spanish. <laughs> so I'm like, everyone's calling me mijo. And I'm like, I didn't even know what a Mexican was. <laughs> to be honest with you, I was like, your family's Mexican. I'm like, what does that mean? I can remember as a little kid trying to figure out what a Mexican was. So it was really interesting uh, to then be exposed to all this. And I always tell this story, too, because it's kind of hilarious. How then um, my impression of what a Mexican was, was they are dark skinned people that eat lots of hot stuff, spicy stuff. So then I remember immediately at that time, even I think at first time was like, I'm going to eat spicy stuff because isn't that what Mexicans do? And it's so funny, like I to this day can eat super duper spicy stuff because at a young age, I forced myself to eat all this chili and really spicy stuff, jalapeno, Abnormal. habanero. <laughs> so everybody's like, because that's what I thought a Mexican does. So I'm going to do it, do it up good. <laughs> so anyways, yeah, it, that was yeah. my first exposure mm -hmm. to the Campos family. Well, and again, legacy. going back to identity, right? Wanting to identify with yep. the culture and very and true all of that yeah. i mean it's natural for a kid to want to do that it's really yeah. interesting mm -hmm. um so we talked about marty and tamra and then meeting uh carlos Sr. oh yeah yep, yep. Um, yeah so tell us about the dynamics on that <laughs> side of the family so yeah this is you talk about blended families my dad um obviously my mom leaves and then he actually finds nancy and marries nancy um and Nancy, he and Nancy then have three children. And so when I met my dad for the first time, it was just two children. It was Jesse and Patricia. Um, so we have same dads, different moms. And then it, Vanessa was born shortly after. Um, and so, yeah, th so now I have three siblings on my dad's side and two siblings on my mom's side. Ultimate blended family, right? <laughs> And it was kind of interesting. So at first we moved in with my dad, which was very interesting. And then uh, my mom even tells this story. She's like, she was curious since, you know, she, she always said my dad, she was very much in love with him. And she was one of her really good friends, you know, when she was with him. And so um, she said she was curious about what type of man, because Nancy, which was my dad's wife, was married before. And she's like, well, I wonder what kind of, 
man that Nancy, granted my dad's Carlos, <laughs> my stepmom who my dad was married to and had three kids with is Nancy. Okay. So my mom's like curious. I wonder what kind of man she would be married to. So my mom meets Jerry, which was Nancy's previous husband, and they end up getting married. <laughs> and so my mom marries Jerry, um, which was Nancy's previous husband. And so now they're married. So it seemed like they swapped, but they didn't. It was just many years in between. But uh, yeah, so my mom ended up marrying Jerry. And Jerry actually had the kids. He had custody of the kids, Essie and Dustin, that were at Nancy gave birth to. I know. You'll have to listen to this again to understand. I mean, when it's you're just dating the man and you're like, so how many siblings do you have? And I'm like, and uh, starts telling the story. Of, yeah. I was like, okay, this is going to be a while for me to uh, <laughs> kind of put it all together. So if you have blended families, <laughs> you have all the mixtures and as the epitome ethnicity of and Nancy was white. <laughs> well, or is white. She's still alive. My dad's Mexican, <laughs> very Mexican, very mm -hmm. Vato-ish. Low rider, loud music, boom, 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 stereo. <laughs> so I was in a total culture shock. I'd never seen any of that stuff, you know. And and yeah, all my cousins were like, "What's up, Bessie?" <laughs> so Campos, that's right, right. The Mexican <laughs> mafia. You know, Campos is a really well known. But yeah. anyways, it was kind of interesting uh, to then to then it, be exposed to that, but then to have like my mom be married to Jerry and have stepbrother and sister now with my mom being married to Jerry and be like double steps. I've never <laughs> even heard of that because double, because double yeah, step. their mom was married to my real dad. That's interesting. I've never heard that. Double steps. I know double steps, right? Huh. Double step siblings mm -mm. on mom and dad's side. Yeah. Anyways, maybe you'll understand later when you think about it. Should I draw a picture? <laughs> I used to have to draw it out for people because it is kind of interesting, but Anyways. All right. So you've met the Campos family. Yes. And, you know, your dad's other kids and you're, you're building relationship with yep. your dad. Yep. Um, uh, what what did you do in school? Like, you know, uh, what so, yeah, well, I grew up uh, once my mom married. Yeah, once my mom married Jerry, um, we moved to Thatcher High School, a small high school. Or Thatcher School, excuse me. I was actually in third grade. Started in third grade and graduated from Thatcher High School. Excuse me. Was the Thatcher Eagles. Woo -woo. And um, <laughs> so small town, little town. And we lived in Central, which is even smaller. Central was considered part of Thatcher. Um, we were called Centralians. And yeah, I grew up in Thatcher. It's a very Mormon dominant town, very family oriented. Um, and it was interesting because going to Thatcher, I got into music. My mom, our family growing up was very musical. Been singing. That was what Phyllis Lawrence, my grandmother that I lived with, she played the piano. We always had singing around the piano. So then when I went to Thatcher, um, as soon as I started high school, uh, junior high, I did a little bit of band. But then in high school, um, <laughs> I was, let's just say a little bit of a, Overachiever, I uh, so I was in student council, was in the choir, was in the quartet, had a job, had um, played sports. Oh, and played sports, <laughs> football, basketball, and time. baseball. <laughs> lettered in three sports. <laughs> yeah, and was in student council too. <laughs> oh, did I say that? Okay, mm -hmm. honor roll, honor society. So like maintained high grades, kind of crazy. That that makes for a really strange thing. Uh, I think maybe I was trying to compensate for maybe subconsciously for being abandoned or something. So maybe I was going to make sure that I'd be the best at everything I do and do everything. So no one could ever think that I was not good enough. Maybe. I've kind of studied and or thought maybe, about all that stuff. Or maybe you had judgment on some of the family members and you wanted to be um better than them yeah. <laughs> or Probably. hard Trying worker yeah exactly you know what I mean like no excuses you know I can remember it's crazy when I think about my high school years well first of all let's just go junior high because I played sports in junior high um 
and did work. I had my own business by the time I was like 11 or 12. I worked for my mom's company. And then I did uh, a little, my own little business doing landscaping. This is funny because this some of you might be able to relate to this. I literally would go knock on doors and say, hey, do you have a lawnmower? <laughs> and they'd be like, yeah, why? Well, I'll be glad to mow your lawn for you. It looks like your lawn needs mowed. But can I use your lawnmower and your weed eater? And you just pay me to use your tools? I'm like, well, sure, little kid, go for it. And then I did it. Uh, me and my buddy, Daniel, and he was older. Um, yeah, he was two or three years older, I think three years. And so, because part of the time he was driving when we were doing this business. So he would drive around, not knock on the door and be the voice. But, uh, and I couldn't drive. So, his name was Dan O'Dell, and we did C and D landscaping maintenance. <laughs> so I've been doing landscaping maintenance for many years. Um, so, but my eighth grade graduation, a, a pretty traumatic thing happened again, which my father got had a situation. Uh, there was a robbery. Uh, we're a small town, and and mm -hmm. it's a it's a cotton farming town. It's a mining town, and at the mine where my dad worked. There was, and there's a prison. A lot, oh, yeah. a lot of people prison worked too, yeah. at the prison. That's why my mom worked yeah, there at one point. Right? True, good point. That's actually where my mom met Jerry. They met at the prison, both working at the prison. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it's a prison town, cotton farming town, and mining town, all kind of right there together in Southeast Arizona. Um, and so anyways, my dad worked for the mine. There was a robbery of some of the homes in, at, in the, this mining town, some of the the executive uh, team from the mines homes and my dad got blamed for being the mastermind. So long story short, um, the reason why I bring up eighth grade graduation was because right before my eighth grade graduation is the marker is when my dad went to prison. And the whole thing was, is like supposedly is a mastermind and they, he plea bargained because they were going to pull his family up. He had an alibi and all this stuff. And they're like, we're going to put your family on the stand. You have to plea bargain. So he did and ended up going to prison. And so I remember that because my eighth grade graduation, my dad didn't attend because he was in prison. So there's that too. And um, I remember, you know, he struggled with his health, with diabetes. And then he struggled too with the whole time being in prison. Mm -hmm. But when he got out, it was really cool because he and I had a really good connection because he kind of had a, a found God while he was in prison. How long was he in prison? Um, I don't know. My my childhood memory is the eighth grade. It's probably 13 or so, 14. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And I think he was in till like my sophomore year. No, he was out. He was out. No, he was out by my freshman year. I was, so it was less than a year. How funny as a child, you think it's a long time. But I remember because he was there at the football game when I broke my shoulder. So I played sports, all four sports, remember. And then as a freshman, or was it my sophomore year? No, it was my freshman year, I think. I can't remember now. See, I um, got pulled up to the varsity and was playing uh, varsity quarterback. I love playing football. And so I was a quarterback as a freshman or sophomore. I think it was my sophomore year. That's what it was, sophomore year. So my dad was in prison probably through my eighth grade year. He wasn't there for eighth grade graduation. And then he was gone my freshman year. And I think he got back just before think, my sophomore year. I feel year. like two years. Yeah, is two years. Accurate. Yeah. And so then my sophomore year playing football, I was starting quarterback for the varsity. And um, we were really competitive with our neighboring town, Safford Thatcher, the rivalry, the Bulldogs versus the Eagles. And so practiced for varsity was going to start for the varsity. And they're like, Hey, we're going to bring you down. Cause you're only a sophomore for the JV game. Cause it's a rival and we want to beat them. And unfortunately that game, I broke my shoulder and dislocated it and was out for the season. And my dreams were freaking wrecked as far as football. Cause I was, had dreams of being like Joe Montana. And so <laughs> that was my hero. And yeah. So again, I didn't not play football again. It's just that that year I was supposed to start as a sophomore starting quarterback for the varsity team was gone. And then when I came back my junior year, I actually played basketball that year. <laughs> my stubbornness. Yeah. I recovered and rehabbed. You didn't rehab. Well, I did because some of my rehab. Started. But basketball season was starting. I'm like, can I just go ahead and play basketball? Can you release me? And the physical therapist is like, no, you need to finish this. And I'm like, 
no, I want to play. <laughs> I'll take the consequence. Let me play. And so he did. He signed off on it a little early. He's like, if it dislocates. And it didn't. But anyways, but then I, I so I played my sophomore year of basketball. Um, loved basketball too as well. And then did a little bit of baseball. Yeah. And then junior year, played football again. <clears throat> that year I played some receiver and backup quarterback kind of stunk. They didn't want to put me back in as a starting quarterback by then. And then my senior year had some more trauma, right? All these stories of trauma. <laughs> well, for me, it was drama, trauma. Um, by the way, really successful in music. That was always my big thing too. I was a part of the quartet all four years. There had only been one other student that had done that starting as a freshman. I made the quartet. It's kind of like the advanced group, you know what I mean? singing some acapella stuff and voice to men back then was really popular mm. but none of us were black <laughs> we were all white but we did our best <laughs> they were white i was mexican <laughs> so but we did our best and I had fun doing that i loved it plus i worked and started managing a golden crowd <laughs> even while i was in high school <laughs> so became the assistant manager at least while i was in high school so then, so, uh, yeah, my senior year, I got cut from the basketball team. That's where the trauma comes in because that was major blow to me. Like I played, so football is like the first sport. And then the next season you play basketball, all right? You go from football into my senior year and then basketball my senior year. And it's really interesting because I played that summer. I'm super overachiever. That summer, I leading up to my senior year, I played the summer league and all that and was in double digits, scored, and did some triple doubles and stuff. So I was really pumped up to play my senior year. And we knew there's a group of us. You know, when you play with those guys since junior high, maybe we're going to take state here. We were ready. We knew we were. Our senior year was it. That was the shit. We were going to do it. And I got cut, bro. And my whole world changed. I started. I actually hated the school then. Once what? I got cut. Why did you get cut? Well, there's lots of theories out there, but the fact that I was playing well and triple double and tall, six foot three and super aggressive and started all the way up to there. Some people say, and I agree that it was because I wasn't Mormon. Now the school, I was the only non-Mormon on the team. And so I did get cut and they did, I did get cut and replaced by a Mormon. But again, they were very kind of, Clickish. Clickish that way. Mm -hmm. um, you guys have probably experienced that. Uh, again, it could be some other religion too that is dominant at a school. This particular school, yeah. I was literally the only non-Mormon on the team. Which, I was a, a Baptist boy. <clears throat> which also presented a challenge, you know, what you were dating too. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, <laughs> nobody would date the non-Mormon guy. Or at least if they would, I had to be studying their, their religion. religion and stuff and be open to it. Um, and it's really interesting because, yeah, it was really interesting because I would try to stay at friends' houses and they wouldn't let me stay at their house either. I couldn't spend the night with buddies, you know, that I was playing sports with because they're all Mormons. So it's kind of an interesting thing, um, how that, that all played out and, and then how it ended that way. It was very, I was very bitter for sure, to say the least. <laughs> so I actually just... Um, I don't even think I played baseball because baseball comes after. I think I actually just quit. I didn't want to go to graduation. I didn't want to be any a part of that school. It was my senior year, so I was like, screw it. I had a good job. I was starting to manage the Golden Corral in our local town. And yeah, man, I was done. Still probably done with that school. <laughs> so much. <laughs> Still. Uh, it's all good. You know, bless them. I, you know, again. No bitterness there. <laughs> it's 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 part of the process of growth and development. Now I look back and I go, it was good. It was really good for me um, to get through that. <laughs> that frustration. <laughs> so um, first, I want to kind of ask you about the team sports. You know, what is the value that it because you played team sports across the board so what for you personally what is the value of team sports and what did you uh gain from it could you say yeah so i mean team sports is definitely a big deal working as a team 
um, as I, especially when I was playing like basketball, like we had this group that we always, there's about, I think there was three of us, Brad, Colin, Aaron, and me, there's four of us that started all the way through junior high and high school. We were the starters and played together and loved playing together. So there's definitely a camaraderie that gets built there. Um, team unity, n- getting to know each other really well and and knowing what each other's going to do. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's really cool how you can get into the flow and the rhythm of things. And I think that really taught me how important teamwork is mm-hmm. and um, the importance of of unity. And, you know, we did a lot of things together, too, as well as friends. So it was awesome. And I, I also then in football, too. There was like my linemen because I played quarterback, like I was really close to them and got to know them personally uh, off the field, too. So it was really that was unique, uh, definitely a unique um, situation and and, and definitely um, it taught me a lot, yeah. taught me a lot of the importance of team and working together yeah. and, and staying in the flow and having that camaraderie for sure and good communication for sure. <clears throat> and um, you were kind of a player. Oh yeah. Yeah. There's that too. My poor mom. I love you mom, but yes, we can't leave that part out. Definitely (laughs) bad, bad player. And that's probably, to be honest, that's probably to be fair about the Mormons. Like they're very family oriented and they are definitely all about, you know, having good moral code. And I had lots of girlfriends. Let's just put it that way. I was definitely known as I had a girlfriend at work, I had a girlfriend at this school and that school and this school and a girlfriend at church. So yeah, I was busy guy. So, you know, everywhere I went, I want to have a girlfriend. (laughs) So whatever, whatever I was working or whatever school I was at, I'd have a girlfriend. I mean, it's just real. Like, so, but it gave me good skills of what I say. (laughs) I, I said I I say now that I was a the womanizer and now I'm just a womanizer of one woman. Ow! Because <laughs> it does take skills to be able to juggle all of that. Yeah. Yeah, it did catch up to me a few times. Yeah. Uh, 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 I mean, again, my poor mother. <laughs> I love my mom, and I know that man. She lost some sleep over this, and I had girlfriends from other towns that I met at Bible camp. <laughs> and then I had, I ended up having affairs with women from married women. married women from work. I mean, it was kind of a mess. Let's just put it that way. Um, I kind of had you some issues. Yeah. Yeah. I had some issues. Uh, and definitely. Yeah. Okay. So we've gone through high school. <laughs> You did graduate. I did with honors, man. I I did. I don't remember graduation. I don't think I went to the graduation party. I was pretty bitter. I was like, once I was like, deuce is peace, bro. I'm like, I'm going to work now. My whole focus was on work. And my senior year, I became uh, the acting manager of the local Golden Crown <laughs> restaurant. And then you were also, though, heavily involved in church. Yep. Definitely, you know, our youth group there, my mom was a youth pastor a lot of the times. And then, yeah, I was heavily involved with the youth group. And 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 then after that, actually, after I graduated, shortly after I graduated, then I started working for a church. I became the youth pastor and the music uh, director for a local um, Southern Baptist church there in, in Thatcher, actually. And so Gene Barnett's church. And they voted me in and a lot of people knew me uh, from the area. The local town boy grew up there, born and raised there. And then plus music was my thing, right? I actually got high honors in music. I got like first chair uh, tenor, uh, which is the highest honor at state choir that you can go to. And so, yeah, so I did a lot of that kind of stuff. And yeah, so anyways, (laughs) then they saw my talent music. So I led music and I led the youth group at this church. And then I met my wife, my previous wife, uh, Lee. Her name was Lee Schlicker at the time. Kind of interesting. Her main name is Schroeder. German. He likes so the German names. names. Yep. So uh, Lee um, was actually, she married. That was her married name. She had been married and had four kids and her husband was killed in a car accident. So she was a widow and yeah i was she was much older uh, yeah she was it was kind of a thing one of my girlfriends was much older 
Um, and then Lee, I always, you know, like the older, more mature women. <laughs> and so she was 10 years older. I was 19 and she was 29 when we met. We actually met at a youth event. I'd met her parents and her parents was like, oh, you should meet our daughter. And I didn't, I was like, okay, sure. Have them come out to this event we're having at our church. And so she did. Yep. And we, and then <laughs> we met and she had four kids and that didn't bother me at all. Um, I, I loved kids. I really did. You know, um, it was kind of my thing. I still love kids very much. Enjoy uh, being with children and, and helping, and you know, encourage children and just, it's amazing. Um, so she had four kids and it didn't bother me. We actually met at that event. Her parents introduced us. And I was like, hey, I sing. I love singing. I hear you love singing. You play the piano. Why don't we meet up sometime? So she came and we met up at the church and we hit it off. Music was our thing. Um, she was an accomplished, very professional and accomplished um, pianist. Yeah. Like amazing. Composer. Probably one of the, Composer. And seriously, one of the best on the planet, without a doubt. And then um, we started singing together and I met her two littlest ones. And yeah, then I went on visitation like a good youth pastor would do. And she had older kids, which I didn't know this at the time. And so I ended up going to visit those older kids. And all of a sudden I realized they're Lee's kids too. <laughs> like, wait, wait, hold on. You're Lee's kids. And we're sitting out. I'm talking to him about the Bible and stuff. And, and then, yeah, Lee and I met that, or that day we, sat on our front porch and just got to know each other and saw the sun come up the next day. You guys know those kind of stories. That's what happened. And we had a lot in common uh, ministry wise and music, music for sure. And so it's like, Oh, it's a good fit. Mm -hmm. We should just get married. <laughs> so how long between that porch time and the time you got married? Oh my goodness. Do you remember? I, you know what? I think it was like a month. Yeah. two months something because, like that it was really quick my mom would happened, know more than I out of town. <laughs> yeah my mom was out of town <laughs> and so while my mom was out of town we went to the justice of the peace and my mom even told her my mom I remember my mom would tell the story but my mom took Lee to lunch and she's like he's gonna try to marry you he loves kids and he likes older women he's gonna try to marry you it's important you tell him no because he's got a lot going on <laughs> She didn't say no. <laughs> my mom was absolutely right. My mom knew me so well. Mm -hmm. And so then started the journey of marriage that I had no clue or understanding what to do, how to be a father, how to be a husband, to be honest with you. It's just like, let's go. I, you know, I love challenges, right? Yeah, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> and so I became an instant father of four so, children. So how old was the oldest? I think uh, it was Lane, Levi, Holly, Savannah. And Lane was the oldest. I think he was probably about 11, 10 or 11, I think. Yeah. And Holly was like seven. Savannah was five. And Levi was two. Something like that. She had four kids in five years. That's always the story. <laughs> Lee had four kids in five years. Then her husband was killed in a car accident. And then I came on the scene, I think it was a couple of years later. Or pretty close to that. So what are some of the things that you learned about yourself during that marriage um, that, you know, kind of, you know, coming into it, you, you, you mentioned that you didn't have a clue yeah. about being a father. And then, you know, what That's were, right. what were some of the, the. Mountains well, it is interesting. The experience hit. that I had, we were together for almost 14 years. Um, and it is interesting because, you know, we did the ministry thing. That's for sure. Uh, we actually went in we did business stuff. I did business consulting, um, started my, our own companies. And she had a company that her previous husband, Ed, who had you know, passed away, had a contract for maintenance. So it was perfect. I had done landscape ma maintenance business, right? Um, so I started doing that, helping to finish that contract. And then we bought a carpet cleaning business. So again, I'm going right back at it. I'm a dad. I'm a new dad. I'm a new father or husband and, and two businesses why not <laughs> cleaning carpets and doing landscaping and so um yeah but i learned for, and doing ministry to music ministry and we helped her dad start a church uh lee's dad and and it was crazy to be a father of four children and just trying to figure this out like what is it 
to be a father. And, and I had no clue. I remember Lane was just, you know, he's 10 years old, just his dad died, his biological father. So now he's trying to be a man and kind of fill in for his dad. And I'll never forget. It's crazy because I didn't know then I was 19. I didn't quite understand being a father, but he would always be like, I'd say something like, oh, we're going to rent this tractor and we're going to run it and clean up the backyard. And he'd be like, oh, I know how to run a tractor. i will be like, no, you don't. Shut up. You're just a kid. And like, he always wanted to be, because he was the oldest, number one. Number two is like his dad had taught him a lot of stuff, his biological father, Ed. And so, and Ed was the hero. That was always interesting to see how the kids zero their never biological, right. right? And uh, yeah, Ed was the superhero, super strong, super everything. Um, and so I was always trying to live up to Ed's um, legacy, if you would, or his reputation. Mm -hmm. No one could outwork Ed. <laughs> no one could, you know, Ed never had to have sleep. <laughs> I just remember all that, man. And so it's the same with the oldest child then. Uh, with Lane, such a good guy too, such a uh, amazing um, child, just wanting to bless his mom, take care of his mom. I remember too, when he would go open his door for his mom, his dad taught him well, Ed taught him to be a gentleman. And so he'd go try to open the door and I'm like, you don't need to do that. I'm here now. I, I Again, shut it down, just shutting him down, mm -hmm. not letting him love on his mama and literally just not giving him a voice. And, and by the way, the other thing that was really interesting about me during this time was I was very much like didn't have a clue what it would be like I'd be as a father. So I was very much an authoritarian and a yeller and arguer. So Lee and I had some amazing blow ups. And then also I had no tools necessarily on how to create epic at all. And, and it's so fascinating because even with the kids, like I didn't let them talk back talk was not acceptable um we had to do these yeah i would spank them like that was lee and i were in agreement with that so it was a lot of this stuff that would was you, not would would you say that that you came in so hard as an authoritarian because you were so young yeah for sure and and you know it's kind of like a like a trying to prove yourself to gain respect but let's or, go deeper than that yeah all experience i had as a father was floyd yeah. Remember my memories of that? Mm -hmm. And so that's, I'd play with the kids, but then you don't, you don't talk back to, to your parents. You don't come to the table without a shirt, mm -hmm. right? Remember all the things I thought was bad or wrong. And I'm like, right. but I'm doing the same, mm -hmm. you know, you got to eat all your broccoli and your vegetables, or you're going to get a spanking, you know, you have to be this, this, this. And so that was my childhood memory of Floyd and that's what I, re you know, that's what I responded to. And then you add Jerry to the mix, my other stepdad, he was a yeller. And so then I became a yeller too. <laughs> and so, you know, as far as, so, so you have the father aspect, but then also the marriage coming from yep. being the playboy. Yep. What did that look like as you came into this marriage and, and what kind of things transpired that you and Lee had to deal with? Oh yeah, for sure. So, I mean, through all that time of being a player and things and, and, and the addiction that it would create and even the pornography, um, I was heavy into pornography. So now coming into this marriage, so, so that hold on. became, let's clarify, right? <laughs> so the player recognized that it was a sexual addiction. Okay. Well, that's kind of fast forward what I discovered. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize it was that, um, but had pornography addiction would medicate with porn or with, um, and that's what would happen then if, you know, cause now I'm the player that gets everything he wants and has all these different girls that created something really strange in the sense of now I've got a wife who doesn't like me, <laughs> you know, at times, at least that's what I thought as a victim and it's like, wait, she don't like me. And so then insecurity, that's right. right. So then I end up, that. you know, turning to porn and I'm going to age myself <laughs> here, but you know, the sex hotlines back in the day when you had corded phones. I know some of you don't remember that and never saw one, but it's real. Um, and so, uh, again, these were some of the things that Lee had to deal with that I was bringing into the marriage. I have to tell you, it was amazing how she dealt with it because it actually ended up where there was even a, a situation with a customer that I had, a woman that an affair built up. And so 
um, she was very gracious. I thought for sure she found the 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 phone bill <laughs> that showed the stuff. Uh, she, the husband came and said, "Look, your husband needs to leave my wife alone," and and uh, so called her up or something like that. And in the beginning of our marriage, just like the first year of our marriage, it was a mess because I was just, yeah, a mess. And she was, <laughs> she's like, and I started packing my stuff. I'll never forget. And she's like, I was thinking, I'm out. She's going to kick me out. That's for sure. And she said, what are you doing? I'm like, this ain't done. And I was like, what? Okay. Well, I got issues. I thought for sure this would be it. And so I do appreciate that, you know, because I had an addiction, a sexual addiction. I had a pornography addiction. And, and so that was my medication. Now, here's what's really fascinating. So she forgave me. And then we went and got help. And I found out that's where I was diagnosed with the sexual sex addict. And then also I was um, in the neural passageways. I learned all about this and we, we do, went through the treatment and, and, and uh, create a new addiction. Well, through that process, I learned all about addictions and, you know, AA stuff and even um, celebrate, recovery. celebrate recovery. Yep. That's it. And it actually, when it first came out, Rick Warren back in the day, I was one of the first ones that, became a uh, facilitator for Celebrate Recovery and brought it to our local area there. So I was very passionate about it, all because of what I went through and got freed from, um, you know, porn and sexual addiction and understood neural passageways. So then I started doing Celebrate Recovery and local and Lee was very supportive of that. And she stayed with me. So it's pretty powerful. Um, and I did create a healthy addiction to God in the beginning. And then it shifted. <laughs> it shifted to a codependent. What did, it, what did it shift to? Go to ahead. a very codependent relationship with Lee, mm -hmm. my previous wife. And um, if you ever you can do some research on it, but it, it's 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 all the classic signs of what that looks like of destroying each other and not realizing it, needing each other, never being apart, not having friends. And matter of fact, I, I pushed my mom away. Mm -hmm. Um, and we push a lot of people away, <laughs> it's just to put it that way, her family, my family, and it was very toxic, very toxic. All, all while doing ministry. That's right. While we were doing ministry, <clears throat> we end up, we started helping her. We helped her dad create a church. Then we did a bunch of prophetic ministry and traveling, got lots of awards, singing national duo of the year for country gospel music, music association, Got paid to do weddings and funerals and singing professionally all giving, over the nation. Given gifts, yeah. money. Yeah, people vehicles. supported us. And we were at one point we shifted from building and developing companies and 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 doing consulting and business development, then shifted into, and I did through the years I built many, many companies, and then shifted into where we could build, we built out some companies and we were able to go into full-time ministry, supported from those companies, but then also supported by people. So I, I did do the whole full-time ministry thing and, and was supported. People bought us vehicles and things. And then we ended up, because we did like kind of isolate and push everyone away, we ended up where we started fresh in Lubbock, Texas. Yeah. And this was probably year 10 of <clears> our <throat> marriage, something like that. No, I think it was 12. Year 12? I think you were in Texas for two years. Two years? Yeah. Something like that. Anyways, the story goes and on. And then... And then we were in uh, Lubbock, Texas in, for a couple of years, um, doing full-time ministry, traveling a lot more during that time. Um, and then we we ended up divorced. Well, it all so, kind of went so into you, a death and destruction. How did that, how did the 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 down uh, downward spiral happen? Mm -hmm. So those couple of years in Texas, there were a couple of key factors mm -hmm. um, as far as like business, what you were doing for business personal yeah. growth and things mm -hmm. that you discovered in the midst of that. Yeah, that's, what did that that's look true. Like? So uh, historically, it's really interesting during that time when um, Lee and I were together, we had gotten into some, we were doing ministry, but also we started doing um, some network marketing, multi-level businesses and, and developing those skills and sales and stuff. And, and so, yeah, we got really involved with some, some big companies and leadership and, um, yeah, I got of course the overachiever has to become <laughs> leadership, right? Yeah. So we got mentored and stuff by some of the biggest leaders there. And we would sing at some of the events and stuff. It was kind of our thing. Um, and also, um, what was I gonna say? 
So then uh, the downhill spiral was, meanwhile, back at the ranch, <laughs> double-mindedness was going on. There was a lot of good like ministry and praise God at, at church. And unfortunately, um, and I'm living proof and it's real, like you hear about it, but it's true. I'm here to tell you it's true that, you know, the, the divorce rate is the same in church as it is out of church. So, you know. The Christians are having the same struggle. And it was crazy because I didn't have the skills. I didn't have the strategy. I didn't have an understanding of what to make it epic. So at home, there's a lot of chaos and drama. There was drug addiction. There was alcohol. There was, yeah, it's just rampant in our home. There was a lot of chaos. Let's just put it that way. I actually went to jail. Yep. I went to jail one time um, wow. for spanking her. I'm just telling you, it was bad. It was ugly. But in the, in the pulpit, we were like, amen. I love you, Jesus. And I, to be honest, my heart was to love God. And my heart was, Lee was amazing. She could study the word like nobody I'd ever met. Three to five hours a day, she would dig that thing apart. So that's what's so crazy. If you think about it, I, I often say this, it's like, it's like brushing your teeth is not in the Bible. But are you going to blame God if your teeth rot out because you didn't brush them? And we actually have some clients that they have rot out because no one ever taught them to brush their teeth. So it's a real thing. The reality is, though, is neither is having an epic marriage, the practical side of it, like up and down, brush your teeth, let up and down for how many minutes. So it's it's often uh, the reality of what I realized at the end of that marriage that just kept snowballing, getting worse and worse. And literally, physically, <laughs> we were both dying. You know, I was pushing. I've got pictures from like that year that we went through our divorce. I was pushing easy 340. 340 pounds. I look so like I'm nine months athletic, pregnant. athletic, fit guy accumulated weight. Yeah. And she accumulated health issues. Yep. Right? So there was literally that toxic uh, physical response right. to the emotional toxicity. That's right. 100%. Right? So, <clears throat> but as you were doing uh, the multi-level, the network marketing, you, you were... Entering into a world of personal growth and development. Yes, more so absolutely. Yes. And so there were some some key, you know, uh, experiences that you had that that kind of opened your eyes. Tell us about that. So true. So it's literally the only time that it's really interesting how when you get yourself in a codependent relationship and in a bubble that nobody can pierce, it all started to kind of unravel. And here's how it did. It's really interesting. So we were doing the personal growth and development stuff studying, learning from leaders. Um, and Lee went to go support our daughter. Our oldest daughter, Holly, was having her first child. And it was our first grandchild. So Lee then flies back to Arizona because we were living in Texas at the time to go be with Holly for her childbirth. And I am telling you, this is what's so strange. It was like year 12 or 13 for us being married it was probably one of the first time it was the first time that we actually had multiple days apart from each other and so what really woke up to me during that time i remember going to some of our business events and and they were talking about like how important your brain is and the mindset and negativity and i was like oh man they're describing my home and all this self-talk and negative talk and how do you talk about yourself what do you think about yourself well i'm 340 pounds what do you think and in that moment, they're like, now whose voice is at the other end of that? And it dawned on me that it was actually my wife's voice at the time, Lee. And I was like, oh my gosh. I remember just, because I stood up in front, we had this little exercise we were all doing for business thing. And, and I stood up and I was like, telling all the things that I hear in my head, the negative talk, right? And they're like, and whose voice was it? And I was like, Ugh. and then I just lost it. Because I, in that moment, I recognized, yeah, I have this negative self-talk but when i realized that it actually came from lee as well and i was doing the same to her so i'm not here to tell you i was perfect no way but the reality is is that in that moment i realized how toxic our home was and it was like all of a sudden this because she's not there i'm actually facing and having to look at the life we had mm -hmm. and she wasn't there probably for i think she spent a week with holly or something like that during the childbirth seven to ten days two weeks max but we'd never been apart for that long. Literally maybe one night, two nights max. I think in the, in the, before that I could count on one hand. And then it just kind of, that awakening kind of like made me aware of it. 
And then I'm like, we got to get help. And so we sought after help because here's a couple that we were literally helping people in their marriage, supposedly um, counseling people because we'd been married like 12 years by this time, 13 years. And I'm like, but this is toxic. Like this isn't what it's supposed to be like. And then all of a sudden I'm aware of like the toxicity, the negativity, the drama, the, the addictions, the challenges, right? And I'm like, what are we doing here? We're killing each other. Like all of a sudden I could see it. I was aware of it. And so then little by little, I was like, we got to get help. And, and it just, yeah, it didn't, it didn't work. And I remember when I left her, um, admittedly, I left her hundred um, percent that I really felt like I was saving both of our lives because it had gotten so toxic and neither one of us has tools or skills or anything. We, we had God, we had the word, but the practical side of it, zilch um and it was just getting worse and worse it was it was not 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 pretty not fun um and i'll never forget the night that i contemplated suicide actually because um the divorce we had we had we had separated and and i was was drunk bottom line when i go back to the house she steals the car that we had been driving that was given to us a new car she steals it and so that I end up sleeping at the house that we were living in um, before we got separated and her dad and mom came and helped her get all of her stuff out of that house. So I'm sitting in an empty house. I literally have one mattress. You know, if you can see the dust imprints of the, and the, the impression where the piano was like truly dramatic. And I'm laying there and I'm like, why am I even living? Why don't I just end it all? Like I have no future. I have no hope. I, I should just end it all tonight. And, and that was a horrible place to get to, to the bottom of the barrel, to realize I have nothing left. Why am I even living? Why would I live? Why do I want to go on? It was super dark because like I failed. The one thing that growing up with my mom, having, you know, many husbands and I had some, you know, a few stepdads and, and relationships, yeah, I like had this thing where I was so judgmental on my mom that I was never going to get divorced. And so now here I am. <clears throat> and I'm like, what's wrong with me? Mm. Why do I, I don't deserve to live. So it's a pretty dark place. So why didn't you commit suicide? I don't know. I don't know that. I never thought about that. I remember thinking of it that night. And I had a friend who committed suicide. A really, really close friend. Someone that actually taught me consulting. Six Sigma lean business practice or lean business practices. And she was an incredible consultant who taught me the, the ropes and, and mentored me. She actually committed suicide. I remember thinking, oh, I could end it like she did. You know, and that was with the car in the garage, windows rolled down, go to sleep in the back seat. And and it's crazy because I remember going to sleep that night with those thoughts. And I remember waking up the next day, like, oh, wait, I'm still alive. Like, okay. It's a new day. Like it was dark and, and I was numb. Like I just didn't have any emotions during that night, but I fell asleep and I didn't act on it. And I'm grateful for that, that they were suicidal thoughts, but no action behind it. But yeah, I guess, cause I woke up the next day and it was a new day and I'm just like, Oh, <clears throat> okay, here we go. I guess we just put one foot in front of the other here and just keep going. I had some really good friends people loved me I had, and I you know some great male friends that supported me through that time and and so yeah I was like I just I guess they their love for me and their belief in me I would say always why and so leaving Texas yep leaving Texas I went back to um Arizona and I remember it was going to be Christmas time. And I didn't want to be in our small town back to Safford, the small town that I grew up in. And we had our businesses in, Lee and I. And we knew everyone, you know, those small towns that have like three or four stoplights and everyone knows everybody's business. I'm like, man, I do not want to spend Christmas here. That's for sure. I'm <laughs> not in this drama going on. And so... I left. I'm like, I call up 
my future sister-in-law Michelle and I'm like hey what are you doing for Christmas how did you hold on on how did you know Michelle (laughs) Michelle I knew Michelle because of our that business I was in with Lee uh one of the, the network marketing and Michelle was a leader of that business and that's actually true too like I was doing a lot of different stuff with leaders and personal growth and development and trying to set a good example and so I met Michelle through that whole process. So Michelle and, Taylor yeah. lived in Southern California. And I had gotten to know her pretty well. And she was cool. <laughs> She's really cool. And she lived in California. And, and she did tell me at one point, like, if you ever need anything, she knew I was going through some rough stuff with Lee. Um, and I, I'm like, okay, this is that time. I'm going to call her to see if she's serious. And she said, yeah, come on. I get it. She saw kind of some of the drama and trauma that I'd been going through with Lee. And so then she's like, yeah, come on, you can come stay on with us. And I got a couch. I'm like, sweet. It's funny because during that time, then I actually was homeless. (laughs) It took me a few years to admit that because here's this successful guy, had many businesses, worked on multi-million dollar companies. And now I'm all of a sudden homeless. Took me a while to admit that. But I was. I was couch surfing, man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I did. I ended up on uh, Michelle's couch. And, um, And then what? Then I met you. You had bride, met me already. My queen. We did in passing. So we did in passing. We had met. Because I was also a part of, you know, company. the health and wellness business, but yeah. I wasn't one of the leaders by any means. But I had <laughs> attended uh, two events that I had seen him at. It's so interesting. Like my my memory of Chantel uh, in passing, like I knew she was Michelle's sister. Really, I did. And I was like, and there's one distinct memory that I remember that was like embedded in my brain and I didn't even know her, but I happened to hear the speaker and I was one of the leaders. So I would do speaking and stuff too. But one of the speakers that went on was talking about like your dreams and, and um, being able to accomplish those dreams and what's holding you back or something like that. And I just remember her leaving the room crying. That really, it impacted me in that moment. I was like, Oh man, that's Michelle's sister. Like, wonder what, what that's all about. So what was that about? <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I don't remember. I think, you know, maybe it was the, so at the time, well, this is not my story. But... <laughs> oh, but you got to tell me now that I'm asking. <laughs> I'm curious why you, if you don't no, remember, so, but there was so a lot at of the emotions time, during that time. I was a single mom mm-hmm. and I was working two jobs, yep. right? And uh, one of those jobs was as a waitress. And the speaker was talking about dreams and talking about how they had um, gone in and tipped a waitress a hundred dollar bill. It was it was along the lines of that. And and of course, you know, being a single mom, that's pretty working cool. two jobs. And so- I don't know that I remembered it was that story. That, but I mean, I believe you. And it's funny then how we've done that multiple times since then, because of course. <laughs> You know, yeah, that is kind of a thing we've that done was, a few times. That was where it was at, and yeah, just kind of the sense. vision of like beyond that, right? Mm-hmm. Like beyond being the waitress Getting that would be tip. wildly blessed by a hundred dollar tip, right? Yeah. So, oh, wow, that's pretty cool. Thanks for sharing that. So, it did make an impression on me, didn't still didn't know her, but then I'm on Michelle's couch sleeping, and I meet this amazing woman who actually saw past my trauma and my drama. And the hurt little boy, um, because again, uh, you know, we'll get into that with your story, but her 11 years experience in working with abused and neglected children, managing the home that she did. Wow. It, 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 I didn't recognize it at the time, but she just <laughs> understood this man who had all this trauma and drama. And, and um, so, yeah, that's where it all started, started was then I got to know her more and and then we built from there it was really crazy Mm -hmm. really awesome though I have to say what an incredible woman she was because Lee and I were separated um we were going through the divorce and everything but it it took a little bit and she was patient um Lee had gotten engaged my previous wife had gotten engaged to a doctor in Vegas and then we were starting to build a relationship and it was pretty awesome she didn't want to be the other woman (laughs) <laughs> like, so you're saying i got a chance <laughs> but i didn't want to be the rebound that's right <laughs> i just had to put it out there so she's like telling michelle can you have a talk with this guy 
<laughs> I'm feeling a vibe. <laughs> I could feel the pursuit. Yeah. And huh. Michelle's like, so, but sure. It, <laughs> she never had the talk. She had the, to do the talk. And then all I heard was, so you're saying I have a chance. <laughs> but in the pursuit, what did what what was your discovery? Like what what really made you personally? Yeah, so yeah, hard, yeah. So right? I mean, it was there was a lot because of I did yeah. give you the limit and like you did. the boundaries. yeah, and you know there the crazy thing about this was recognizing like her strengths and what a strong woman she was, single parent, not making excuses. One of the things that came up with Lee um as as I was um going through that relationship with Lee was she didn't want kids. It was Ed, her previous husband who passed away, uh, that wanted the children. So Lee didn't want children. <laughs> she would say that. But she loved them and 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 raised them, of course. But that was a thing, you know, and then also Lee was stay at home mom. So I wasn't used to a woman that works three jobs. <laughs> and I would say three jobs because she worked two that she made money at and one that raising two children. And so it was like, I was intrigued. Here's this woman that has all this work experience. She works and hustles and works and hustles and, and raises her children. And her children were the priority too. That was a different thing. Like, because I remember asking, hey, you want to go on a date or you want to go hang out? And she's like, but I'm doing this with my children. My children come first. And I'm like, whoa, okay, yeah, good. I, I, I appreciate that. That was new to me. And then the other thing was also that her she had friends. Right. Remember, we were in a codependent marriage. So it was weird to me that Chantel actually had friends. And then when I talked to these friends, all these friends had all these stories of how Chantel had really made a difference in their life. And she had blessed them so much. Like she did this for me and she did this for me. And I lived with her and she was this and this. And I'm like, whoa, the fruit, right, was so just voluptuous. And yeah, and then she was. So. <laughs> <laughs> she was hot <laughs> that was a definite bonus too but it was cool like to to experience and understand this woman had so much fruit right you shall know them by their fruit and I saw it and the other thing too that was so intriguing to me she didn't have a religious background she wasn't like she was she'll tell her story but she was born and raised Mormon but then they left the Mormon church and she knew God and knew Jesus and understood salvation, but didn't like wear the badge that I'm a Christian and didn't go to church. So it was really weird for me because I had not been around a girl that actually was committed or understood love and understood God, but didn't go to church. I was like, is that even possible? Yeah. <laughs> How is that possible? Right. And she had tattoos. Yeah. I was like, yeah. I was like, this girl's rebellious, man. She's going to be some party animal and i was in a rebellious state for sure didn't believe in marriage anymore didn't want to be married yeah i was pretty broken so and rebellious so she saw something different thank goodness and then that's so where we started connecting and you started helping me mm -hmm. heal and uh see a different story how was that for you you know again going back to the father uh the 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 journey as a father right and and what the results of that were with your first marriage and then yeah. so you know what did that look Sorry. like coming into you know our relationship because obviously I had two children yeah you know it's kind of an ironic story like a a, a marker in time taking it for what it is when I was leaving Lee the night I left her I remember carrying her into bed um and she was passed out at that time. And I remember showering that now and just begging God, I can't do this. I, I don't have the strength to leave her. And that was the moment I was going to leave her. I made the decision, but I couldn't make it. And I remember sitting there and just praying and begging God. I, I knew at this time with what we had created in our marriage and in the atmosphere of the home at during that whole awakening during that time when I was aware of all the negativity, the toxicity and what a horrible father I was in the sense of so like judgmental on my kids, so dictator, so authoritative, right? Just controlling. There you go. That's the word controlling, very controlling. In that moment, I'm like, God, will you ever give me a chance to do this again? Will you ever allow me to be a father again? I don't deserve it. 
because of what I've done here to these kids, to their mother. And, and, and I'm like, you know, I was taking responsibility for what I'd done, but now I, I didn't know how to fix it, had no clue what to do. And we had gone to counseling and it just wasn't working. And, and so that's in that moment, I asked God, would I ever have an opportunity to have kids again and, and have this scenario again? Essentially, I, it was so weird. And what was so interesting when I met Chantel, that was another thing that was crazy. Awesome. The oldest was the same as the oldest, almost same age as ten. was 10 as, as with Lee and the youngest was two, was 18, two. Months 18 months old hazel was 18 months old so it's like <laughs> my gosh when i realized their ages was 10 and hazel was 18 yeah. months old like almost 10 he, he was nine almost yeah. 10 and when i realized that it was like this epiphany like what in the world like i am getting another opportunity to do this again and that's where we started our journey but i was like we are not doing the same thing we're not doing religion. We did get married. <laughs> I can say we just, we've been together now for over 14 years. That's what's so crazy. 14 years on one each side of it, right? Experiencing both. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, we've got your journey up until. Yeah, good point. Our marriage. Yeah. And, uh, um, you know, we'll, we'll follow that up after you hear my story. And then we'll do how it came together beyond. Right. So beyond did. marriage and, and what we've done together, right. I think I think we have a good uh, understanding of the foundation of Long. Carlos Campos, <laughs> Carlos Ramon Martin Campos, the, the man second. behind Epic. <laughs> right. <laughs> and it is, that you know, was it's a powerful journey. Uh, it's a powerful journey of, you know, what kind of what builds a man, what builds a woman, what creates our character, what creates our passion what creates our mission and and really feel, fuels uh, why we do what we do. Um, you know, it is those experiences and, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, right. It's all necessary and it's super awesome. So thanks for sharing your story. Thanks for interviewing me, babe. <laughs> bringing it out. That was good. I really appreciate you. It's so good. Awesome. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll, we'll do a follow-up, uh, you know, our journey together and beyond. So thanks for joining us. We will catch you on the flip side. <laughs>